faithwire.com. Hello and welcome to Foreign 3, the podcast breaking down four of the most important stories of the day and three things you need to know about them all from a distinctly Christian perspective. Today's Thursday, January 14th, 2021. I'm Dan Andros. The four stories we got coming up today. Number one, the House votes to impeach, but what's Pelosi going to do? Is she going to send it to the Senate now or later? A media blunder by several journalists so massive. You got to hear it to, to believe it. Uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, is, sp- is speaking out now about uh, in detail about the ban on Trump. And uh, President Trump has released an Oval Office address calling for peace ahead of the inauguration. We have got all of that and more, along with Trey Goins Phillips from FaithWire.com. Trey, what's going on? Hey, Dan. So I'm having to join you from my phone because my internet's down. It just kind of reminds me of how important the internet is. <laughs> you get, you're you getting a slice of what it feels like to, uh, you know, get, lose access to your ability to, to, to have your voice. Yeah, to be censored. I mean, you, we kind of take for granted all the ways we can communicate and... Uh, you know, yeah, like parlor like saw. Trump right now. Yeah, Trump. <laughs> just turn. They're just turning everything off. Um, you know, we can kid about it, but it is gallows humor because I mean, there's stuff coming down the pike for sure, and um, yeah. a lot on the line. But I want to start uh, story number one with yesterday's impeachment uh, proceedings. The House voted 232 to 197 to impeach the president, as expected. Ten Republicans joined. Uh, with the Democrats. So what's the left saying about it? Well, they made a flurry of arguments uh, yesterday, and they seem to focus quite heavily on the incitement argument, claiming that Trump's uh, quote and lies and rhetoric uh, caused people to go riot on the Capitol. Supporters uh, also said that Trump is, quote, too dangerous to stay in office a minute longer. Uh, One congresswoman even called President Trump the, quote, white supremacist in chief, uh, was the term there used during the the hearing. So what's the right saying? Well, those against the impeachment pointed out several times the double standard from the left, uh, arguing that Democrats are now, quote, finally discovering that rioting is bad. Um, one congressman argued that if politicians were held to the standard that Democrats are currently applying to Trump's rally speech, then it'd be a ghost town in Congress. They'd all be fired. Uh, others noted that the president specifically said to march peacefully and patriotically to the Capitol, which he did. Um, in that same speech, he said to fight like hell. That was that was just one line out of an hour plus long speech. Um, both of those lines, you know, uh, just plucked out of there. Um, but he did say both. So the media focused on the one and not the other. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, it matters because we've got long term implications here um, yeah. as to what happens from here. Uh, you know, Pelosi appears to be uh, bringing this to the Senate, the articles of impeachment after Biden's inauguration. That seems to be the plan, even though there's little hope uh, that there's they're going to be able to convince 17 Republicans in order to get a conviction, which is what they'd need, uh, you know, because Trump's going to be out of office at that time. And some are raising questions that it's even if it's even possible to uh, convict a former president, um, Judge J. Michael Ludwig. He was a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for 15 years. He wrote in the Washington Post that the Constitution clearly says, no, he cannot be. And the reason is, uh, this judge says, uh, is found in the Constitution itself that Trump would no longer be incumbent in the office of president at the time uh, of the delayed Senate proceedings and would no longer be subject to the, quote, impeachment conviction by the Senate under the Constitution's impeachment clauses, which is to say that the Senate's only power under the Constitution is to convict or not an incumbent president. So, uh, so that's what's on the line, Trey. I mean, the, you know, there's you see the unrest now, and um, how they go forward, especially given Biden's pledge for unity, is gonna um, have have a, I think, a big ripple effect on the country. If the, this judge's take is the correct one when it comes to impeaching a president who's no longer, you know, sitting in the Oval Office. Uh, then that would kind of take away the uh, the motivation for any of the handful of Republicans who are backing it, right? Yeah. Because it seems like their main motivation, uh, at least on the Republican side, like I said, is just to ensure that Trump can't run again, uh, which is actually a second vote that would happen right after um, the, the, the conviction for impeachment. But um, 
it, it just seems like that would kind of take the wind out of the sails of, of that uh, motivation for, for impeachment. Uh, since Trump will no longer be there, we will have inaugurated a new president who, like you said, is claiming to be all about healing and unifying the country. Uh, so it seems to be kind of like a, a two things that are not – can't be married together, uh, that the Democrats want to marry together, which is unity, but also let's impeach a president who's no longer in power. <laughs> it's unity, but here's my boot. Have a, t- have a taste. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't see how this is going to be good for the country in any way, really. I, I think at, at this point, just ride it out. He's going to be gone uh, literally in, in one week's time uh, anyway, uh, and we'll have a new president. Absolutely. All right, I, I'm eager to get to this story here, number two, Trey, because I saw this happen yesterday, and my mind's blown. This is unbelievable. <laughs> just, just take it away. So during yesterday's uh, House debate, like you mentioned, Dan, over President Trump's impeachment, Representative Louis Gohmert uh, called out the left's double standard when it comes to quote inciting violence. So here's the clip we're going to play for you from the House floor. Here's a quote: I just don't even know why there aren't more up aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. Or, sadly, the domestic enemies of our voting system and honoring our Constitution are right at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with their allies in Congress of the United States. We were called enemies of the state. Those are all quotes from our speaker. Now, on our side, we didn't take those to be impeachable because we we didn't believe... She surely meant that. But by the Democrats taking this action, you're telling me, no, when we say those, we actually mean to incite violence. So, uh, yeah, that's Louis Gohmert there, Trey. And I mean, what happened with that clip is unbelievable. So uh, Gomer was, of course, like he said, he was referencing Pelosi uh, in June of 2018 uh, when Trump was facing criticism over his immigration policies. Uh, and the quote about domestic enemies of our voting system was also Pelosi uh, <laughs> over the summer when she was responding to Republicans who right. uh, were voicing concerns about the mass mail in voting. So here's the, the crazy thing. Uh, Without missing a beat, several reporters from the Washington Post, uh, from Politico, from Vox, were all (laughs) quick to say, oh, my goodness, Louis Gohmert is calling for uprisings, uh, right, as the inauguration is about to happen. Uh, A law and crime columnist uh, said that Gohmert's testimony should, quote, be used to immediately expel him. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Wow. So so they kind of proved his point immediately. Uh, so what, what, what's the left saying? Uh, the left spent most of last summer, like we've talked about, Dan, endorsing and embracing the Black Lives Matter movement, many of whom failed to call out uh, and condemn clearly and continually the violence, a standard they've been placing on Trump for four years. Uh, so now they're arguing Trump should be removed from office just days before he leaves the White House, arguing his uh, rhetoric is what incited the violence in the Capitol. What's the right saying? I, so th- this is the, the the right is just calling out the double standard. <laughs> right. The fact that that Gomer can say what he said, talking about comments that Pelosi made, literally quoting word for word verbatim what Nancy Pelosi says, and then reporters get on Twitter and immediately say, look what Louis Gohmert is calling for. <laughs> it's like they proved his point, and they proved the point that conservatives have made, which is not that they're necessarily disagreeing with concerns about Trump's rhetoric, but apply the same standards to yourselves if you're going to apply it to Trump. Right. I mean, uh, so Yeah. I mean, just to interrupt real quick, it's like a real-time yeah. example of media bias because the same right. clip, when it comes from a Democrat, they said nothing about it. But then the minute they hear it and think it's coming from a Republican, they freak out. It's unbelievable. Right. Right. And that's that's my point about why it matters is if if those words were wrong for Louis Gohmert to say them, which he didn't, uh, Pelosi said them, then they're yeah. also wrong when Pelosi says them. Uh, and, and we need to, to get to a point where we where we can admit that. I mean, like over the summer, when I have a story on faithwire.com about this, uh, we watched CNN tiptoe around condemning anything. Yeah. Uh, during one protest that devolved into a riot in Wisconsin and Kenosha, CNN literally ran the Chiron fiery but mostly peaceful protest <laughs> after police shooting. I mean, it's and then, crazy. I, t- Dan, you have to remember MSNBC. <laughs> Uh, Ali Velshi, yes. he was literally standing yards away from a building that was set ablaze by rioters. And he said, 
I want to be clear on how I characterize this. This is mostly a protest. It is not generally speaking unruly, but fires have been started. <laughs> it's, it's just absurd. I mean, it was the exact, and, it was like he was trying to re- recreate the scene from Naked Gun with Leslie Nielsen. I mean, it was, yeah, it was exactly. pretty much that. Nothing to see here as things are exploding behind him. <laughs> it's just miraculous. So, I mean, my, my thought here is if the left is going to take this high and mighty moral stand against the incitement of violence, then, you know, we, they need to be applying the same rules to themselves going forward. We can't yeah. have a repeat of what happened over the summer after this impeachment hearing now over Trump's rhetoric inciting yeah. violence. Well, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that they start holding themselves to the same standard if and when we see yeah. uh, more rioting. Yeah. And I think this is where worldviews matter, Trey. And I think and people on the right, we've talked about this, Trey. You've got to be able to call a spade a spade when you see violence like we saw last week at the Capitol and it's perceived to be coming from the right, whoever the perpetrators end up being, you got to call it out. You, you can't. Yeah. Yes, we can point out the double standard, you know, from people who might be on the other side of the spectrum as us. But, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to got to got to be able to call truth as you see it, regardless right. of what political side it's on. Our, our ultimate allegiance has to be to Christ. And that's how we can be different from the world. And I think that's how people like these media folk are susceptible to this stuff because i think most of them are secular right and most of them don't hold to a high their highest authority is the the political views they hold that is the highest authority they have and so they don't want to betray those and and whether it's intentional or not sometimes um you know they're not going to betray them easily because that's their ultimate standard and as christians you know what is our standard our standard is god's truth and that doesn't bend to anything that doesn't bend well, to anything. I, Whereas the le- the left, and se- particularly the secular uh, left, yeah. and even the se- people who are secular on the right. I mean, I'm sure there are people who just justified those riots by uh, at the Capitol by some political motive. Um, and so I would argue that they're not putting their trust in Christ either. So we've got to have that uh, front in mind. Yeah, and we can't, like, you know, I, I kind of see it as a, we have a moral compass, obviously, that, that keeps us grounded, right? And if yeah. there's a, if we allow our politics to become a magnet that's just circling around the compass and that, that moves what our true north is, uh, then there's a problem. Uh, people on the right and the left, if you're a Christian, uh, then like you said, Dan, we've got a higher allegiance uh, that's, that's about absolute moral truth that supersedes all of this stuff. Uh, and Christians, uh, us at CBN and Faithwire, in particular, that that's what our mission is, is, uh, you know, we're going to call a spade a spade. Like you said, when we see wrong, we're going to call it out. When we see right, we're going to praise it. Uh, and we're just going to, you know, try to rightly divide truth like scripture says. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. I concur. All right. Story number three, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, he released a lengthy Twitter thread and we're going to try to hit some of the highlights of it here, uh, discussing his ban uh, on President Trump's Twitter account. And uh, here are a few of the highlights. Uh, I, w- I would just, if you uh, Google it, uh, you know, I, I, do we did we cover this on Faithwire Trey? I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head if we actually covered this I don't think we have, but I think CBNnews.com CBN has, has a story it. on it. Okay, so you can find the thread on CBN. Just look for Twitter, Jack, banning Trump, and you should be able to find it. But uh, here's a couple highlights from it because it's interesting. He says, quote, I don't celebrate or feel pride in having to ban Real Donald Trump from Twitter or how we got here. Uh, After a clear warning, we take this action. We made a decision with the best information we had, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, was this correct? He said, I believe it was the right decision for Twitter, but some caveats, big ones. He said, that said, having to ban an account has real and significant ramifications. Uh, While there are clear and obvious exceptions, I feel a ban is a failure of ours to ultimately promote a healthy conversation. Um, he said also that it, quote, it sets a precedent that, quote, I feel is dangerous. The power an individual or corporation has over part of the global public conversation. Uh, and he said the check and accountability on this power has always been the fact that a service like Twitter is one small part of a larger public conversation happening across the Internet. If folks don't agree with our rules or enforcement, they can simply go to another internet service that used to be the issue that used to be uh something that we took for granted but then he adds this concept was challenged last week when a number of foundational internet tool providers also decided not to host what they found dangerous i think he's referring to parlor there he's referring to the other platforms just banning trump 
And then beyond that, you're refusing to do business like banks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so very, a very disturbing sort of trend. Um, and so he said, we all need to look critically at inconsistencies of our policy enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the other part I thought was interesting, Trey, and I'll leave it here, is he said he, ta- he talked about funding an open source uh, sort of decentralized internet um, because he said that, uh, you know, that was what they wanted to do initially with, uh, Twitter, but then started moving towards centralizing everything for a bunch of reasons he didn't get into, but, uh, that they're trying to fund now an open source and decentralized internet, kind of like having the SMPT or whatever it is for email. Yeah. Um, and so they're trying to do that, uh, because he's, he admitted, he said, look, centralized enforcement of global policy to address abuse, misleading information, et cetera, is unlikely to scale over the long term without it being uh, too much of a burden uh, on people. So I think he's seeing Mm -hmm. that, okay, we took this action on Trump. I understand why people are saying that it's unequal, the enforcement. And it sounds like he's admitting that it is unequal (laughs) Yeah, and and saying that it's almost impossible if we try to scale this up to every single thing that's going on there that you're just not going to be able to do it. So um, so what's the left saying? Well, we did report on faithware.com about what um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said. She's calling for the government to, quote, a commission to dispel, quote, misinformation from the media. Hello, 1984. It sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> so what's the right saying? Well, they're clearly frustrated at the lack of consistency, and some are calling for Section 230 and the government to regulate these platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why does it matter? Well, it matters for the reasons we've been talking about lately, because these decisions are going to really have big time ramifications for how we communicate with one another. Um, some people may have a more of a favored status. And especially yeah. when you look at what culture believes versus what Christians believe, people who are Bible believing Christians, you can expect those two things to be at odds with one another. And so you can expect yeah. problems on that front. I don't know exactly what they'll look like, but expect problems on being able to interact with society uh, when you stand firm on biblical truth. Yeah. Well, I mean, first, I'm, obviously, I'm glad that Dorsey is saying what he's saying, just because at least it seems like he's acknowledging and understanding that there is an issue here. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm not certain that it kind of, you know, takes away any responsibility for the actions that he's taken, obviously. Right. Um, but I think it kind of highlights the the tough line that conservatives have to walk, which is that we do support corporations making private yeah. decisions about yep. their own corporations. Uh, but these institutions have also, like Twitter, Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, have become so huge that they've almost become utilities. So we're kind of trying to figure out how yeah, do we... Right. How do we best regulate that when they're essentially now the public square? I mean, this it's akin now to somebody back in the day going into literally the, the public square outside in their communities and, and being limited from speaking would be akin to what's happening now. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of a it's a tricky thing for conservatives to walk, because, like I said, we we value individual liberty over government regulation any day. Yeah. Um, and so. what and what do we do going forward? Because. Do we just assume that Twitter is a thing that we have to engage in? I mean, can we yeah. can we instead just do not like a boycott, but can we just do a campaign to say, hey, just eject yourself from social media. Let's yeah. get on the ground. What's a more effective way to communicate with somebody if you want to uh, challenge ideas? Is it via Twitter or is it in person? I mean, if we yeah. maybe there can be a push to let's start rekindling person to person contact. Now, of course, I know right now that everyone's going to yell about that. Oh, you're trying to kill people because of the virus. You know, maybe we wait till the virus has calmed down a little bit before we really go on to this push, but I mean, I think something like that might be needed and might be the way to go because you want to be on the cutting edge of things and and I just don't see Twitter. I mean, who's who's ever had a Twitter interaction and said, "You know what? We went back and forth on Twitter a few times and they just came right over to my view." It was amazing. I, I won all the arguments, and now there are a bunch of you know Christians out there. We're like, eh, yeah, I don't know that that ever ha- has happened. <laughs> I don't know. I just I I always feel so so good with myself after an argument on Facebook. You know, <laughs> yeah. You, I feel like I've feel really so improved empowered. improved society with my uh, <laughs> with my mic drop point, or <laughs> or getting owned by someone else when they you yeah. know come back at you with a point. So. A lot to think about there, so uh, especially from a Christian perspective, and I think there is some outside the box thinking that's going to have to take place because pretty soon we might be we might be forced to be outside the box. So, yeah. story number four, Trey. Yeah. 
So following uh, Wednesday's uh, easy House vote uh, impeaching the president, uh, Trump released a five-minute uh, address from the Oval Office uh, condemning violence and calling for peace ahead of President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration uh, toward the end of next week. So in the video, uh, which was shared by official government accounts, since Trump no longer, no longer has personal accounts, uh, on social media, he rebuked the violence that unfolded in the Capitol uh, and called for calm as he transitions out of office. So here's that clip. My fellow Americans, I want to speak to you tonight about the troubling events of the past week. As I have said, the incursion of the U.S. Capitol struck at the very heart of our republic. It angered and appalled millions of Americans across the political spectrum. I want to be very clear. I unequivocally condemn the violence that we saw last week. Violence and vandalism have absolutely no place in our country and no place in our movement. Making America great again has always been about defending the rule of law, supporting the men and women of law enforcement, and upholding our nation's most sacred traditions and values. Mob violence goes against everything I believe in and everything our movement stands for. No true supporter of mine could ever endorse political violence. No true supporter of mine could ever disrespect law enforcement or our great American flag. No true supporter of mine could ever threaten or harass their fellow Americans. If you do any of these things, you are not supporting our movement. You are attacking it and you are attacking our country. One thing worth noting is that's probably, I don't know, Dan, if you recall, that might be one of the most forceful uh, condemnations Trump has ever given yeah. uh, regarding any sort of uh, violence or unrest. Uh, so what, what's the left saying? I think for the left, this is just too little too late. Uh, it, all of this seems inherently political anyway. Uh, they've argued that no matter his condemnations, uh, the president's rhetoric to this point has been too irresponsible, too unpresidential, uh, and that he is responsible solely for the violence that erupted in the Capitol. Uh, so that, what's the right saying? Several Republicans have agreed uh, that Trump's rhetoric is troublesome at times, uh, but most of them haven't gone so far as to say he should be impeached and convicted or removed from office a week ahead of his exit anyway. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who's had kind of a tenuous relationship with Trump in recent days, uh, seems to have waffled on the issue. But he did say this week, like you mentioned earlier, Dan, that the, the Senate is not going to end up taking up the issue of impeachment until after Biden's inauguration on the 20th. Uh, so why does it matter? I, I think this matters uh, because it's critical, critical for Trump as the leader of the Republican Party, whether he's president or not, uh, to be obviously condemning uh, what happened at the Capitol and to do it clearly. Uh, he also has a role to play in the, the presidential transition of him leaving and Biden coming in. Uh, so, you know, say whatever you will about his comments. Uh, and I think that there are some fair criticisms of Trump, but this is a good message from him. Uh, and I think that it's one that the country, as well as those who voted for him, obviously need to hear uh, because it's it's part of the president's job to instill faith in our institutions. Uh, so, you know, I just have to say that, that at this point, I'm hoping and praying uh, that the double standards stop, Dan, that, you know, the Democrats and the reporters who have spent years now condemning Trump uh, will apply the same rules to themselves that they've been applying to Trump for, what, five years now? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath. I wouldn't hold your breath yeah. on that, as, yeah. as you mentioned before. <laughs> well, that story that you mentioned earlier, I mean, when you with the comment you just made there, I think about that. And we're not off to a good start. We're not right? off to a good start. Yeah. And I, look, I've worked over my career. I've worked at uh, CNN. I've worked at Fox. Um, I was a former head writer for Glenn Beck for many years. And so uh, took that journey through those various buildings. And what I saw there was not people that are by and large, at least this was this was 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, whatever was the last time I was there. Um, but particularly at CNN, it's just the way they see things. It's not necessarily there's this big conspiracy to be liberal, but right, just right. everybody there is just liberal. And that's just how they view it through that prism. So just like those reporters, when they see it, they don't you know, they don't think about it that way. And I think, yeah. as you mentioned, there needs to be return to that. There needs to be return yeah. to slow down. I think the going for the click, I think, has cost, you know, journalism, it set journalism years back not rushing yeah. to because you and i were on the uh on the on live on youtube trey while while the whole capital mess was going down and 
you know, we didn't know what was happening. So all we could do was report the bits and pieces that we were getting and not jump to conclusions. And I know people try to fill space. They want to, you know, uh, get a headline going. But, you know, yeah. when you jump to white supremacists, you jump to all these conclusions. It's just you end up being wrong and then you're put in this position. You got to defend it. And it just ends up not being not being a good thing for journalism overall. So uh, yeah. so we'll see. We'll, we'll see if we can t- take a step in the right direction. I don't know if this will help. And having having worked at, at a couple different conservative outlets and having colleagues that I know have worked at uh, more liberal outlets, uh, I've learned over the years that I think the, the number one best thing that we can do for the country, and obviously as believers, is to step outside our echo chambers. If we stay yeah. just in our echo chambers, like a lot of people at CNN and probably at, at Fox, MSNBC as well, uh, if they just stay in their echo chambers, whatever their political ideology is, uh, then, then all you're going to end up doing uh, is stirring up more division and then we need to be we need to be doing everything we can to avoid that yeah i mean for example i saw npr write a piece it was the i think the one millionth piece on um evangelicals and why do they support trump (laughs) and uh, so i read it because i was curious i wanted to see what their take was and uh they interviewed uh, i'm trying to remember which pastor they interviewed but they did interview a pastor but none of the questions revolved around anything that's happening on the left and so I think part of the reason you have to understand Trump and why why Christians would support Trump, given his questionable moral ethics and moral behavior at times, um, you have to look at what's happening on the left. Right. Because yep. uh, a lot of people feel forced into that vote because of how things are moving on the left and how radical they're getting on the left. And so, um, so to your point about getting out of your echo chamber... They don't even understand the the basic reasons of why um, Christians would act uh, in the way uh, that they would act. So, all right, Trey, we're running out of time here, so we are going to roll. That is all we have for today. And as always, for more news from a distinctly Christian perspective, go ahead and stop over at faithwire.com and cbnnews.com for a daily visit. Uh, We would appreciate that very much. So God bless you. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, with our last uh, episode of the week. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.